Jaden Ivey is a 6 foot 5 guard out of Purdue, who going into this draft is considered pretty much a consensus top 4 pick, maybe dropping to 5 with the entry of Shaden Sharp, who I'll also have a video on soon. Ivey recently turned 20 years old and played 2 years in college before declaring. This year he averaged 17 points per game, 5 rebounds, 3 assists on 53% effective field goal percentage. We'll look quickly at the play type breakdown of his game, and looking at his most high usage play types, he was 39th in pick and roll ball handling out of 149 players with at least 150 possessions. That's just a hair away from being in the top quartile. He was 32nd among 131 players with more than 100 transition possessions, that's just about in the top quartile. And in isolation, he was 37th among 168 players with a minimum of 50 possessions, this time that's comfortably within the top quartile, so grading out very well in all these high usage plays. Some lower usage stuff here, but he was only in the 44th percentile on spot ups, but he was in the 89th percentile on handoffs and 69th percentile on cuts. A quick look at his background, and Ivy is from a very athletic family. His mum, Niel Ivy, won the NCAA tournament with Notre Dame before being drafted into the WNBA, playing her rookie year for Indiana while pregnant with Jaden and his father Javin Hunter played briefly in the NFL before injury ended his career. It was Niel who raised Jaden and he was always around as she became an assistant coach for Notre Dame. She later spent a year on the bench in the NBA for the Memphis Grizzlies, where she coached a huge inspiration for Ivy, John Morant, before returning to Notre Dame as head coach. This has been a life in the making for Ivy, one crafted by the many women in his life who paved his way, and this June his dream of hearing his own name called out on draft night will finally come true. The Morant comps are obvious, and while you do get pushback from some who think this sort of comparison is lazy, it's pretty clear Ivy models his game and even social media after Jar, and it's something he's spoken openly about. That being said, it's also clear Jar was a much superior prospect coming out of college, and when he was putting up 24.5 points and 10 assists a night for Murray State, anyone could see the potential for him to be a number one option in an NBA offense. For Ivy, his output is more muted, and those who have him more like the 4th or 5th prospect in the draft often describe a large golfing class between prospects such as Paolo Boncaro and Chet Holmgren, and then down to Ivy. They see a two guard with ok shooting, clearly a lot of athleticism, who can handle the ball in transition, and only sometimes in the half court. For those who have him right in the mix as a top 3 prospect, well within the range of his peers, they see a vision not yet materialised, where he's more of a point guard. You'll see throughout the video where my view lies, but you'll also see a lot of clips throughout his season to make your own mind up. I'll try to present a good breakdown of many aspects of Ivy's game, and with that, let's get started. If you're drafting Ivy really high, if some team thinks he's worth a second or third pick let's say, it's because they see his lead ball handler potential, but at Purdue he was a second option, and Zach Eady had a 34% usage rate, and often Ivy's job was to stand in the corner and hopefully space the floor which is at least partially why his raw numbers won't blow anyone away. He definitely had the ball a lot to be sure, but he was also often tasked with watching Edie try to score, towering over everyone else in the paint. Knights three for eight from the three point line. Morton, man in his face at the top of the arc, into Edie in the paint. I think what's important to know is Purdue is a heavy X's and O's team. They aren't just freelancing and letting their guards run a million pick and rolls. Ivy was often used off ball because he's their fastest player and can also hit catch and shoot shots and then drive off his weave action, which we used a ton throughout the year. Did you tell me Purdue's averaging this year? 90? More than 90 in each of their three games, and they're going to hit it again, is there at least a good chance? Well, that'll... In the NBA, many teams have star guards, and then they load up on 3 and D wings, but how many 6-7 guys can chase someone this fast? You're either going to ask your guards to chase, tearing them out, or switch, and that's when Ivy can punish a mismatch. Ivy from the wing, yes! Ivy could be so active off ball, he curls from under the rim here, offering a passing option. He looks to cut off his back screen, then he's signaling for a cross screen here, but the point guard is relocating to the corner and isn't looking. That's three different possible plays, and he didn't even touch a ball once. A lot of his movement was still about opening up the big men to score. They had him run Iverson cuts, which is primarily an option for the cutter to score. It's literally named after Allen Iverson. However, for Purdue, it was the action behind which was the real priority, clearing the way for a centre to post up. You lose the fifth leading scorer in the conference early, and you're thinking, oh man, and here's Finnessy who has stepped up at a huge... Ivy running off ball was often just a way to clear up a strong side for more post-ups. He has three of them, and he's assisted on the other four. Ivy for heels and 
Don't think Hubert Davis minds at all. Williams inside looking for space, goes right hand. And even when Ivy did get the ball, Purdue was a real motion-heavy offence, lots of passing, screening, constant movement, and Ivy was being asked to play make in a system. It shows he's capable of moving off ball, yes, and he can be trusted to make passes to shooters coming off screens from the top of the key, but it's not point guard in the modern NBA sense. At times Purdue's offence was a work of art, every cog in the machine flowing in unison. This was the third ranked offence of all 358 Division 1 teams, it was incredibly effective. This isn't any sort of criticism, but the point I'm trying to make is I think Ivy could be pushed into an on-ball, heavy usage role on the right team, running pick and roll and driving and kicking. This is why I'm so high on him, not the nice system type stuff he did in Purdue. We'll be looking at all aspects of his game in this video, I just wanted to set the scene a little bit first to give some context behind how his team played, and with that we can dig in. So far I've shown a lot of pretty boring clips of Jaden Ivey standing around, making entry passes or running off ball for a catch and shoot three, but it's time to show some of the real highlight clips, because what most people can agree on is Jaden Ivey might be the most electrifying player in this draft. Points for the starter, 23 from the bench, and Big John a dozen, look at oh. Ivey, oh my! I'm just going to leave a few highlights here playing of these crazy dunks to let the video speak for itself because you only need to watch Jaden Ivey for a few minutes in any given game to realise he has special, special athleticism. Ivey with another steal! He's gonna lay down another one and a windmill dunk! Ivey with the steal! Beautiful dunk! Jaden Ivey, I'm falling out of my chair! Dark ball movement, spacing, watch out. The head coaching experience. Yes, it is, and a, and a guy that can command respect from players. Oh boy, Ivy, Ivy, Ivy! A lot of these clips are turning defense into offense with his penchant for jumping passing lanes and grabbing steals. And I wanted to highlight this clip I paused here in particular to show the kind of momentum swinging plays Ivy can make, which can turn a game on its head, forcing opponent timeouts, cutting down a lead, or ballooning your own. One of the things I love about Ivy's athleticism is he's not just a straight line driver going at 100 miles per hour. He can accelerate, then decelerate, and then start again at the rim, playing an off-kilter style all while keeping a live dribble. Leaves the game, they've got to take advantage. How about when Coburn and Payne are out? Two. It's a one-point game, first place of the Big Ten on the line. That was a bear hug from Demonte Williams, and still Ivy scores. Pass away from the body, hand off to Ivy. Trying to get his way into the paint, he'll launch a shot. Iowa hanging around. Now 13 and a half, now nine. Shot clock dwindling. Ivy. Wow, that was pretty, huh? I said Swanigan. I was thinking of Caleb Travion Williams with a rebound. Okay, went back at the time. He has a certain patience, which, when you put the burst on top, means he can kill a big who is switching or in show pick and roll defense, rounding the corner like here and taking it to the rim and throwing it down. Four or five minutes here today. I think they're they're growing. You know, I, I thought that there was maybe some things exposed. As this is hardly a new revelation, but watching scorers like Anthony Edwards, John Morant, and now Jalen Green, I've begun to realise just how important first step burst is. All the skill training to one side, this is one thing you just can't teach, and as much as these guys all put ridiculous amounts of work and time into their body, it's still something that's some sort of God-given or completely natural talent. Now, inside of four minutes, Ivy going to try to take it off the bounce. As you would expect, though. I don't know if Ivy is quite as fast off the mark as those players I mentioned, but we're really just nitpicking here. He comes into the league the second he's drafted in the 98th or 99th percentile, just completely elite at that first step burst. You'll see a lot of these clips for foul drawing because players are so quickly beaten they have no idea what to do when Ivy is just charging full steam ahead of them down the lane. And that brings us to our next segment. When he's in transition, Jaden Ivy is a whole different animal. When he puts the burners on, he has players reaching in, stumbling backwards, just doing everything they can to stop him, which often results in fouling. He draws free throws on 26% of his transition possessions, 
And if he's anywhere near that number in the NBA, it would rank among the league's absolute best. Good defense. And a little bit strong for Patrick McCaffrey. They gotta contain Ivy in transition. Yes, they do. It's not just his pace which makes Ivy elite though, and what I really like about him is his composure. Slowing down when necessary and hitting a shooter with an insane pass like this. Ivy to the corner. Reading the floor to see the rim running center. Nice. And the feed, Ivy to or staying in second gear just long enough to wait for the center to catch up and be in place for a finish. And of course he can stop and start again with a defender still trying to get in position to get to the rim. Ivy hangs, can't hit. Another really impressive part of Ivy's transition game is how he keeps his handle alive despite the speed he's going at. At times he has a high dribble but rarely loses control, pushing past defenders who get a glimpse of ball only to realise the blur is already ahead of him by the time he can react. Here comes Ivy in the open floor all the way to the rim. He's good in tight spaces and can get low and transfer the ball between hands and invent shots on the fly. Not everyone blessed with elite athleticism can also do this. Gordon launching off on that three. Ivy with rebound number two. Ivy only has a 14% turnover rate as the ball handler in transition, which considering the speed he's going at is incredibly impressive. For comparison, in college John Moran had a 28% turnover rate, so he was throwing the ball away twice as often. Russell Westbrook had a 19% turnover rate, 21% for John Wall, and 17% for Derrick Rose, and then 16% for De'Aaron Fox. So Ivy is comfortably lower than all of these players that you'd probably consider his very high-end peers. Short. Well, he liked it as it left his hand, but it was short. Now here comes Ivy. Oh, what a move! Jaden Ivy! When you talk about athleticism, watch this young man go to the fifth gear. Jack Knight took the rim to avoid the defense. In and out dribble, past Plummer, jumps past Curbelo, and still has enough hang time for the layup at the rim. When he's bringing the ball up, Ivy is often looking for his perimeter shooters. This is where he gets to play point guard and show off his driving kick game, collapsing the defense and hitting the open men. Here he comes. Moves like this, driving with incredible speed and control, jumping in the air and throwing it back to a trailing shooter, or what NBA teams with running gun styles will be salivating over. Rim. Rebound by Caleb first. Stefanovic faked the shot, dumps off to Thompson in the corner. Thompson thinks about running. Ivy, one of the best in transition. Ural step pass out. Thompson for three. No good. Step back of the foul line, and Edie grabs his third rebound. Ivy on the push in the open floor, weaving through all kinds of traffic. Morton now the hesitation. Ivy averaged 1.42 points per possession in transition, including assists, that's good for 76 percentile. Being that efficient on a per possession basis, with the high frequency Ivy has, always looking to grab the ball and go, jumping in for steals and passing lanes, his height as a rebounder, being able to get the ball from the weak side, it all makes him probably the best transition player coming out of the draft. But of course he could always be better. As we'll go on to in our next section, finishing at the rim through contact and hitting tough shots from a floater range would bump his scoring up to the next level. I've already shown some clips of Ivy's first step, but it deserves emphasising that this is what makes him a very good isolation scorer. He scored 0.98 points per possession in isolation, good for 80th percentile, although he only isolated on 10% of his possessions, and only 80% of those possessions was he looking to score himself. Ivy can obviously blow by most defenders attempting to stay in front of him, but he also has some craftier drives too. He uses a hop step on this drive, he completely loses the defender with the crossovers here. And he can also bring out the big man and get a crazy separation for a three point shot, something we'll be looking at later. Ivy, step back three. Got it. In pick and roll, Zach Eady's gravity as a screener gave him all sorts of open lanes to drive straight to the rim. And as I mentioned before, bringing the screen defender up high is an open invitation for a blow by. You can imagine the havoc this would cause with a pick and pop big man in a handoff. 
Play drop and the big man has an open free point shot. Come up high and Ivy is burned by you, forcing rotations behind. Unfortunately, we now have to come on to what is a large weakness in Ivy's game, going left. Certainly in the first half of the season we saw at times, although not that often, an absolute refusal to go left, even when the driving lane was there, begging to be taken. A smart defender could sit on the right shoulder like here and blow up the play despite Clint eating half the court. Part of what's made him go lately has been so aggressive going to the rim. This was probably the most jarring example, but it was also so jarring because it stood out so clearly. I don't want to give the impression this was happening every game where he's so clearly declining the left hand drive. It was a red flag during scouting, but a pretty obvious one that Ivy will be aware of better than anyone, and something he will be undoubtedly working to improve on. Many young guards coming into the league are forced into their offhand until they can prove that the scouting report on them is wrong, and Ivy will be no different. I noticed around halfway through the season, Ivy became way more willing to drive left, and he seemed comfortable enough with the handle, but he was still transferring the ball to his right hand on the shot attempts, increasing the degree of difficulty. I couldn't find stats for pick and roll scoring going right or left, but in isolation his points for possession are about 0.9 for both directions, almost exactly equal, but also on a very small sample size. Todd Whitehead from Synergy released some data in mid-February, after two thirds of the season, that showed that Ivy only attempted layups with his left hand 15% of the time. Many of the prospects are also one-handed when finishing, it just shows his tendency to switch hands even when driving left, but at this stage of his career, we'll probably take that, as long as he can get to rim with frequency. His shot chart gives us a clearer picture, showing that within 8 feet of the rim he was shooting 49% on the right hand side, compared to 39% on the left side. But again, this is a small sample size, as it's not including all layups and dunks right at the rim, which are marked separately in that one circle there showing 68%. He did have some craftier finishes too, being patient and locking his defender behind him. Ivy picking his way and against it. Mano a mano! And Ivy uses the glass. Or on this up and under here. Ivy, letting the game come to him. Eventually Jaden started snaking the pick and roll from the left side, which is a natural antidote to his problem, being able to bring the ball back to his right. And it was great to see him add this to his game. He can make passes deep in the paint, or just dart to the rim and finish with the right hand. If a defender does try to sit on the shoulder or is in ice coverage, trying to send him to his left, sometimes he just takes the open imitation and throws up a shot. If you're not pestering him, you're basically giving him an open look at the rim, and he's not likely to turn that down. Ivy will just pull from deep. In the NBA, however, where many teams play drop coverage, it's these pull-up mid-range shots you'll have to hit consistently to stay efficient. And spoiler alert for the next section, this is a mark he struggles to reach. Early. Ivy just picking his spot. It's important to note that while snaking can be a vital part of guard play, these are still really tough shots, and being able to drive comfortably and finish with the left hand would make the game considerably easier for him. This is all nice to have and masks his weaknesses somewhat, but you can't exactly rely on it, especially because shooting from a mid-range and finishing from a floater area is a weakness as I mentioned, which brings us on to this next segment. Defense by Edie. Purdue got pretty fortunate there. That was a three-man post trap, and Caleb first really gave Jacob Grandison another good look. IB. Kevin and strength. So, important context for basically his entire offensive game is Ivy is not a good finisher if he's not right at the rim. If he's meeting resistance and having to invent shots on the fly or shoot outside the restricted area, he's really struggled. You probably noticed when I put up a shot chart earlier, the amount of blue on the image, and these poor shooting percentages are basically anywhere not within 4 feet of the rim. For context, I'll switch now to shot frequency, and you can see the minuscule percentage of attempts from the mid-range, literally just a handful of shots and there's not much more in the paint away from a rim either, but that is a weakness of itself, because if he's just a transition player and open layup finisher, as impressive as it is for him to create those opportunities, it does cap his ceiling somewhat. I'll play some clips here of an assortment of shots I clipped as I was watching. Some makes were mostly quite bad misses. These are tough shots, off balance, twisting and turning and absorbing contact, and in a more spaced out NBA offense, he may have more success anyway, but adding a floater and some craftier finishing moves would help him enormously, and in fact, it might be his main key to success. He's also simply going to need to get better at finishing through contact and making the sort of tough circus shots the best guards in the game are able to make on a nightly basis. Ivy Haven't had a free throw in this game, Ivy. Uh, Ivy, feeling good, takes it in. Speaking of flying, here's Ivy. Now step back, now back at it. On Ivy now driving in, takes a jumper. We will be watching. 
later this afternoon. Ivy kind of muffed it for a little. Ivy all in the top ten. As here is Ivy into the body. Isaiah Thompson. And here is Ivy doing what Ivy does. And for more context, I do think there's some foul baiting going on here, and Ivy is an elite foul drawer, so you don't want him to stop. But obviously there's going to be some bad misses too, when you're encouraging contact and kicking your legs out as he does. College referees are also notoriously not great, so there's some missed calls here on huge contact too. But let's not beat around the bush. Ivy simply has to get an in-between game, because at the moment it's a huge part of the offence that he just doesn't have at all. We'll move now to the three-point shooting, which I think is still a big question mark for Ivy going into the NBA. The top line numbers show some real improvement from his rookie year, going from 25.8% last year to 35.8% this year. A 10% jump is pretty incredible, but as we look deeper, this is far from convincing. Ivy started the year very hot, and to be clear, it was more than just a few games. For the first 20, which is more than half a season, he was bombing from deep at a rate of 44.2%. But many watching, including myself, didn't want to get carried away on what is still a small sample, and for the remaining 16 games, he shot 26.2% basically back at his previous year's rate. These sorts of wild swings can happen when you're looking at a sample size of less than 200 shots, and my only real takeaway is that anyone drafting Ivy shouldn't try to convince themselves that they have any great confidence in how well his free point shot will translate to the NBA, although obviously we will have some hope he can keep improving like he did this year. One thing in his favour is that Ivy's form is very consistent. He'll get his feet together in his preferred stance quite well like in this clip, and it's something he's good at doing very consistently, whether it's off a dribble or off a catch. However, what stood out to me, and I'm by no means a shot mechanic expert, and nor do I really know how much stock to put into such things when looking at a 19 or 20 year old, but his arms and hands do stick out far away from his chin, and from my understanding, this isn't quite preferable. What is a cause for optimism is Ivy takes really deep attempts. This is NBA range, and he's rarely anywhere close to the line. The website CBB Analytics shows that 63% of Ivy's three point shots are from 25 feet and further out. And remember, the NBA line is set at 23 feet and 9 inches. And what's even more remarkable is he actually shoots better from this range at a very encouraging 36.7%. I looked at every single college basketball player mocked on Tankathon to be drafted in June, which was about 50 or so players, and Ivy had made the most three-point shots from this distance at 40. Only one or two other players had even come close. So what I'm saying is Ivy is the most prolific deep-range shooter in the draft, and he does it at a very respectable clip. Another important point of context is Ivy shoots a fair amount coming off screens or running around off ball. This introduces a higher degree of difficulty, as you're going from movement sometimes running away from the basket and then catching and shooting, sometimes getting a chance to set the feet, other times trying to find balance mid-air. Ivy excelled on such shots, hitting 42% on the year. I mentioned earlier in the video that if you're really high on him it's because you think he can be a high usage on-ball player, but in fairness if he's able to do this throughout his career, his value off-ball as a 2 or even a 3 in 3 guard lineups is pretty self-evident. It's really a tale as old as time, but almost every fast athletic guard can struggle to pull up and hit a three point shot off a dribble. But surprisingly, Ivy shot basically the same on pull ups and on catch and shoot shots, both around 35%. Usually, players in his mold see a drastic difference. Like all the best guard prospects coming through each cycle in recent years, Ivy is able to get wide separation through step backs and side steps. For these boiler makes it so much harder to defend. Ivy will step back for a three. Shot hunting now! And he's such a fearsome driver, defenders are backpedalling as soon as they see him with the ball. And he's able to manipulate this by taking a step back, pulling up, and he's happy to shoot in the space they give him. Ivy step back three, yes. And this is a very advanced move. The defender is moving well, he's in step, but Ivy uses the crossover and the speed of his dribble to eventually send him the wrong way. And that moment of misdirection is all he needs to pull up. This is what the best guards in the NBA can do. They're watching the defender's feet, going deep into their bag, and as soon as they see them shift a hair too far one way, they're reacting and going up. Incarnate Word team misses the shot. Ivy, step back, he loves that. We have another example of him here, leaving his defender completely lost, and the footwork to jab step heavy with his left, and step back into his natural shooting form, with that lead right foot first, all in balance, is extraordinary. So we'll move on to the next section, which will look at Ivy's playmaking ability, which has been a topic of conversation all year long and can easily divide opinion. Since I first watched Ivy, I thought he was a point guard masquerading as a shooting guard, because I think in today's NBA, guards who put heavy pressure on the rim and can pass out of drives generate so many scoring opportunities for others. But how exactly can a player who averaged 3.1 assists this year be a point guard? One thing that held Ivy back when thinking of him as a potential PG is the lack of pick and roll play with his centres. 
Zach Eady is a tremendous college scorer, and Trevion Williams is probably one of the best passers above 6'10 in the world, not just in the NCAA. However, neither of these are the sort of rim-running centres who can get up and down the floor with Ivy and offer that lob threat. These are the centres a lead ball handler would ordinarily prefer to play with. Of course, I did say earlier that Purdue had the third best offence in the country, so the team as a whole didn't miss this toolset exactly. I just see a different potential vision for Ivy's future and who he's partnered with at centre. This play here is a good example. As Ivy goes around the screen, Zach Eady rolls and Ivy is ready to pass, but Eady is too slow and as he gets into position he isn't ready to catch. Instead, Ivy has to wait a half a second longer, and by this time help from under the rim has come. Eady still scores because he's 7 foot 4 and has a 65% field goal percentage for the season. It's just not a perfect synergy, and if Ivy gets to play with a more mobile big man in the NBA, I would predict a big boost in assist numbers. Of course, it could just be that Ivy is a score first guard, and on 65% of his pick and roll possessions, he's looking for his own shot rather than passing. But whether this is his own preferred playstyle or a symptom of Purdue's system and their centers, we don't really know. First place in the Big Ten on the line if Purdue wins. It's a three-way tie. Eating upstairs in for the Boilermakers after just six minutes last time out against Michigan. Nice save. Nebraska got the win because of the play of Dickinson. They're going to have to be better. To make up for the slow rolling of his big men, Ivy adjusts by jumping in the air with his great hand time and buying himself an extra second for the centre to get into position, and then he hits him with the pass. Oh, to be clear, this Illinois team just had its largest ever win at Assembly Hall in terms of margin of victory on Saturday. Ivy to E with control of this Boilermaker offense. Driving into the paint, quick pass into first, and that's good. Even when the big man is already in position, Ivy will still use this jump because it helps him slow the game and gives him more time to make the read without forcing a tricky pass. And if you played basketball as a kid and are getting traumatic flashbacks right now to your childhood coach screaming at you not to jump in the air and pass, please just try to let go of his bad advice because certainly the level Ivy is playing at, this would be a ridiculous restriction. And with this move, Ivy can slow down time and make better passes. With his height, he's unbothered by traffic, and he gets so much attention on drives, he's often waiting for the help to come to free the center. Get to the basket. He started all 13 as a true freshman at point guard. That just doesn't happen often in Wisconsin. He's also more than capable of finding the big man with shovel passes and wraparound passes in traffic. Looking for some daylight. He just dances, doesn't he? Ivy, who lost the ball, uh, gets it back. And then dropping a dime to Williams. Breathtaking. Than Chris Holtman did last Sunday. Williams. Nice work. What's likely going to be needed more in the NBA is these deep drives into the paint and kicks to the perimeter. He'll probably get more defenders going under screens, shading him left, sticking on the shooters on the perimeter, and not giving up easy passes. But what will help him is the fact that the NBA is still a guard oriented pick and roll league where downhill pressure can create so many drive and kick opportunities. And this is where I think Ivy can follow in the footsteps of playmakers like Russell Westbrook, Derrick Rose and James Harden earlier in his career before he became more of an all-round point guard he is now. Those guys didn't average many assists in college, but when they got the ball in their hands more in the NBA and got to the rim, they could all make passes like this. Ivy weaves through traffic to the corner. Caleb first. They're going to pressure those passes to the post. Oh, Ivy had a wide open look. Speaking of open, family number 60 in the ESPN 100. There's Ivy as they move the ball really nicely. Just beyond the free here by the Hawkeye. Ivy to the corner. Thompson, shot clock at five. Ivy loads it up. CJ Marchesani from the Stepian tracks really valuable data on player gravity. Gravity is how often an on ball player drags defenders away from others and onto them. In other words, how much defensive attention they command. Ivy was in the 99th percentile among all Power 6 players. Often, some of his passing was just really simple kicks to the player stood closest to him, because when he's setting up a drive, the defense is immediately helping through a gap defense, whether that's intentional or just some sort of natural instinct. These are very simple passes in a vacuum, but it's only because Ivy is one of the most terrifying drivers in college basketball that he creates them in the first place. And that's a large part of what playmaking is. Jumpers, Isaiah Thompson knocks it. Ivy, 
Watch the mismatch inside. Shot clock under 10. Hunter will try. Heidi has a surprising amount of patience on drives where he can pick up his dribble, pick his head up, and then find an open shooter off movement. At his age, everything about his playstyle and physical profile suggests he should be a turnover machine going at 100 miles per hour and not really having a plan. But I went through every college guard drafted in the top 10 over the last decade, and Ivy is well in the top half for lowest turnover rates. Thompson, and he got it for three. Ivy into Coburn. Trying to steady himself and nothing there. Instead, it's Hunter. Now, some of these reads, realizing that there's an open man on the perimeter, can seem a little slow, and this is an area where he may struggle early on in the NBA, as he'll have to get used to the speed of the game and shooters being close just so much quicker as the defense rotates, and that's if he enjoys this much gravity as a driver in the first place. Gillis back from the suspension, and Watt, super sophomore Jaden Ivey with 20 points. Ivy is able to hit the pick and pop pass too, at times making really nice behind the back throws with pinpoint accuracy. However, I did notice that often he comes to a complete standstill, turning and hitting his man. This probably won't cut it in the NBA, where rarely is a good shooter given the time and space on the perimeter for that long. What I'd love to see him add is the ability to throw a pass behind his shoulder, in the way that other tall guards like Lamelo Ball can do automatically. This isn't just a flashy pass for show, it's the fastest way to hit a trailing shooter behind you. Now to be clear, I have seen Ivy make this pass, with his offhand in fact. It's just fairly rare to see. Being able to hit the top of the key is especially crucial in the NBA. So many teams run double screens with one roller and one popper, although Trey Young often uses the behind the back bounce pass here, which is even more advanced. Or teams will run horns, where there's often a pop option. Or the Chicago set, where a player comes off a pin down into a dribble handoff ball screen, and the original screen flares to the wing. Anyone familiar with Ivy's game will at this point be waiting for me to arrive at his weakness, which is the missed reads. First of all, I'd just like to say I don't love going frame by frame and looking for the exact moment a player playing at full speed in a high level basketball game should have made a pass. That's pretty easy to do from my armchair. In this instance, for example, Ivy could have thrown a hit ahead pass, but that was also pretty clearly risky to do, and he had every right to just keep going himself. However, over the course of a year, it is pretty clear that Ivy does miss passes that he needs to get better at, and it's completely fair to say that if he's going to be an on-ball playmaker, this is a big area that he needs to improve in. And this is the biggest point that his detractors really have, whether he can do this at the NBA level and whether he can get to a point where he's averaging 6, 7, maybe more assists a game. Honestly, as I went back over the games, there were less of these than I expected, having heard the noise throughout the year, but he's certainly leaving money on the table with consistent misreads. Of course, he can get tunnel vision at times, he is asked to be a downhill scorer, but he needs to be more aware of his corner shooters. Driving kick should be his bread and butter, and this needs to be a pass out every time. That's a 44% three point shooting guard stood in the corner. There are other times where Ivy sees the right pass, but just doesn't connect. This is actually more of an issue in my opinion. Without any sort of tracking data, just using my own completely flawed mental note taking, I thought I saw more bad passes such as these, rather than just completely missing open shooters. It's time to look now at the other half of the court and dig into Ivy's defense. And we'll start with screen defense, because whether Ivy is going to be a point guard, a shooting guard, or a combo guard, being able to defend a point of attack should be his calling card. He has all the strength, length, and athleticism to be a good defender, and if he is the one, that produces the tantalizing prospect of Ivy being the smallest player in your lineup maybe at 6'4", 6'5". I want to start this section with a clip showing just how disruptive Ivy can be when he keeps himself in the play as the on-ball defender after a screen. He doesn't even anticipate the screen particularly well here, but with his speed and how far away from the rim it is, he's able to get back in front where his size and control completely blows up the drive attempt. Ivy can be inconsistent as a screen defender, where he gets slowed down by heavy contact too often. It's a little tricky to assign blame because maybe this is Zakidi's fault for not calling the screen out, and the screener does move quite hard to the left, but this does happen a fair amount throughout the year. He's a step slow which gives his man a head start. And this is good technique planting the heel of a lead foot and then trying to push off, 
but he's already trailing and gets caught, as he did in these other clips. Quickness, and then the dump off to Trevion Williams, a big time play from a big time player in Jaden Ivey. To Guardian. Gordon, right at the top of the scouting report, averaging over 20 points per game for this Nichols team. Pump. Armando Bacot used to wear him out, but you can see the improvement of Edie. Love inside. This is the textbook example of what to do, and he's clearly more aware of the screen coming. Panther lead foot is able to slide laterally, dipping his shoulder to cut the angle. Eat the elephant all in one bite. Two team has scored 90 or more points first three games. It's never done that before. They're playing pretty well without. There are a couple of very specific issues I have with Ivy's screen navigation. The first is he can be easily rocked one way with a crossover move or an in and out dribble or even a simple head fake. The ball handler can commit Ivy one way, then change direction and Ivy is behind. It's tough, but to be a great screen defender, he'll have to learn to be more disciplined and be better at reading the guard. Especially in the NBA, which is a perimeter oriented league, where so many even average guards have a dribble package with moves and feints that can get by him. Abby is fast and shifty himself, though, so he is able to recover and get back into position at times, too. The other issue is a weird hitch he has at times with inefficient movement. I'm talking about this little jump here. This time, there's no fake from a guard, he's looking one way, he's absolutely committed to a driving left, but for some reason, Ivy takes a little jump the wrong way first before trying to push off and go around the screen. This is inefficient movement. It's harder to jump one way than push off and explode to the opposite direction. And it's made doubly worse by the fact he's moving away from his man and giving himself further to chase. And I'm not a biomechanics expert at all, but I also wonder if this has the potential for knee wear and tear. This is just kind of an odd habit which has no doubt already been picked up in the film room and it's one he'll just have to work out of his game. I'm going super in detail on this because I think Ivy is excellent at contesting and setting front and I think he has so many tools to be an absolutely fantastic defender. If he's able to guard screens like this more consistently, he can thrive as a point of attack defender in the NBA. He has a great leap and a wingspan to bother shots and pull-ups, and he has the strength in his torso to absorb drives. A mid-season game against Illinois who had a top 50 ranked offense was probably his best of the season as the pick and roll guard defender. He's dipping his shoulder, using arms as leverage, and showing multiple efforts, something he's usually good at even when slowed by screen contact. Wish they had. Oh, this boiler struggle. And there's more clips here of just phenomenal defensive work. Oh, good hands by Ivy. Plumber leading. Defensively, oh. nice job challenging that shot. Curbelo navigating to the paint, leaning with the. I could match up with his intensity because Jaden Ivey is putting a uh, statement on early in this game. Here is Curbelo. Whips it into the corner for DeMonte Will. This is an area where I saw a big improvement in the season, his patience reacting to the ball handler. As I mentioned earlier, at points in the season he could get easily beat by an in and out dribble or a crossover and would telegraph which direction he was going to go. The ball handler would reverse and go the other way. In this game he was able to stay in step, reacting in real time without telegraphing or being too slow. It's no surprise that when Ivy is able to go under a screen, he's very hard to score on. He has the acceleration to meet you at the free throw line and the strength and length to disrupt. He's active and bouncy, but disciplined enough not to reach in and foul. The outskirts of Philly produced a lot of really good players. Cam Reddish. Under four to go. And Ivy all over him. I'm repeating myself now, but he really has all the tools. And look at this, which is just a small forgettable play, but watch his footwork and the change of direction. That's that fluidity and elasticity buzzword scouts and podcasters often use to describe this sort of athleticism. Combine that with being able to decelerate and stop, and being ready to contest and drives like here, and then with what is often tremendous effort chasing, as in this play, and you have almost everything needed to be a really strong screen defender. Now let's look at one-on-one -on -one defense, or isolation defense. Anytime Ivy is alone on an island, tasked with stopping a player looking to drive on him. There's a lot of overlap here with his screen defense, but Ivy is basically just a really strong one-on-one -on -one defender. He's excellent going backwards, side to side, sliding his feet and staying in front of his man, while keeping his balance with a strong torso to absorb contact, trying to bump the ball handler away from his spots. They might have had one last year. 
Okay, and a lot of those, but Indiana's been able to dodge the bullet of employee number 55 getting hot a little bit. You know it. We've been watching this kid on film and in practice. This kid is really, really good around. Ivy has a very long wingspan, and you can see here how he uses it to make himself bigger, making free real estate that much smaller for the driver. Backing down on Ivy. And I've already mentioned this, but because of his length and jumping ability, combined with a deceleration, he's able to put up really strong contests on pull-ups. These are huge physical gifts for defending the perimeter. Houston, the guy is still trying to figure it out. They've got some pieces there. Now Liddell is going to fire. That's a deep three. Love with Ivy on him. Way deep. And we can't talk about Ivy's defense without mentioning his insane ability to stay in hard drives and get blocks like this, which can instantly lead to fast break opportunities. These are loud momentum plays that get the crowd going, and it really helps rim protection when your guard is never out of a play, even when beaten on a perimeter. The basket. First half point. Down Bronx. Look at Johnson. Johnson, they don't have numbers. He takes it to the rack and Ivy. Incredible. The downside, of course, to this is there are times when he fouls the driver with the arm coming down, but his timing is more often than not very good. On Travion Williams, kind of got him out of his comfort zone, forcing the air ball. Inside a whistle. To wrap up, I wanted to do some quick hits on other areas of Ivy's game. These won't be as detailed, but do require at least touching on briefly. The first is the lack of cutting, according to Synergy Ivy only took 12 field goal attempts off of cuts this season, which was a bit weird with a passing big man like Trevion Williams often sharing the floor with him. He was definitely roaming around off ball in lots of set plays, but in a more improvisational scheme with the defensive attention he commands, maybe we'd see more attempts to leverage this with backdoor cuts. He's so explosive he doesn't need much of a head start, hopefully this can be a bigger part of his game in the NBA, especially if he's in sort of free guard lineups where he might be in the corner of a slot more with more 45 cuts or cuts from a weak side corner. We didn't talk about the off ball defense and Ivy can be a good helper with his wingspan, but he can also overhelp and leave his shooter too open. There's also the backdoor cuts he gives up, this isn't happening every game but it is something he needs to clear up. And on occasion he can be caught out quite badly. He was oddly really poor at this in the Big Ten Championship game against Iowa where he was leaving his man open and leaving his man to get offensive rebounds behind him. You could probably make the argument that this warrants more criticism and I'm brushing over it a bit. I tend to think that most young guards can get caught napping earlier in their careers and I think it's just attention to detail and being in a demanding environment. He might get that in his rookie year or he might come in year 3 or 4 once his team is good enough to compete or go into plan. I tend to think off-ball IQ is more important, and I rarely saw him just looking completely lost, not knowing what the scheme was. Just tightening up the concentration isn't a huge concern for me when evaluating his defense. Next is the screen setting. This was a pretty consistent part of his off-ball game, and there was a wide variety of his back screens, pin downs, DHOs, cross screens under the baskets using a decoy from his usual cutting action. He's a scorer, so defenders are drawn to him. So when he sets a screen, it often confuses the defense, and he's got a strong frame and always makes really solid contact. So this is a small but valuable part of his game. Three pointer up by first. Stefanovic from the elbow. When these two delivery men, Walker and Hogard, are playing well, Mitch. People can tell you about it all the time, but until you experience a beautiful play, another one. If I can say it. Right <laughs> Lastly, I wanted to focus on some of the bigger moments of the season, and for many, unfortunately, that will only include the final game of the season, where Purdue lost to St. Peter's in the Sweet 16. Ivy had a stinker, clearly trying to take over the game and put the team on its back, but playing out of control, showing visible signs of frustration and deep unease at things not going his way. He shot 4 of 12, had 2 assists and 6 turnovers. It was one of his worst performances of the season, and it was a huge shame because he had been on a great run in the end of the year Big Ten Championship, where they lost a nail biter to Iowa in the final, and in the NCAA tournament up until that point. In the five games prior to St. Peter's in those tournaments, he had averaged 20 points per game on 49% shooting, with 5.4 rebounds, 3.4 assists, and 2.8 turnovers. 
He'd had huge moments in games this season, taking over, hitting game winners, but clearly he struggled at times to be the number one guy. And if a team that drafts him tries to put the ball in his hands and make him a fulcrum of the offense, which I hope they do for his development, they will have to live with real growing pains and lots of turnovers. I wanted to do a whole section on marquee matchups, but I realized that would probably make this a two hour video instead of a one hour video. So instead, all of the clips you've seen in the scouting report are from selected games where Purdue is playing a team either ranked in the top 100 on offense or the top 100 on defense. They had to be in the top third of one of these categories amongst all Division 1 teams to filter out the minnows. But I did want to focus on one other game in particular, a later season matchup against Michigan State. Michigan had AJ Hoggard on Ivy. Hoggard is a long, wiry perimeter defender who has good footwork, is active with his hands, and was causing Ivy all sorts of problems early on. Ivy travelled and you can see the limitations of his work on the drive, trying to brute force the lock and put his head down and push through. Hoggard strips him here, and again on this drive, Ivy beats him but makes a poor error, bringing the ball back down to his left hip before going up, right there for the taking. By now the crowd is all over this matchup, and so is Hoggard. There's an upset on the cards and the player with eyes on maybe even being the number one pick is kind of in jail. He's already learning from his mistake, and on the next right hand drive to the rim, he clutches the ball to his chest, not giving the defender a glimpse. And then Ivy does this. He misses the shot, yes, but this dribble move is exceptional. And to finish the half, he comes off the Iverson cut, into a ball screen, drives, and makes a right lead to hit the wide open shooter. In the second half, Ivy mostly has it figured out. He's playmaking, getting into the heart of the defense, running pick and roll, driving left, and making shots. He was able to compose himself and turn around a tough matchup in front of a hostile crowd. Now I've seen criticism that Ivy has too much tunnel vision and that he's a low IQ basketball player, and while I think the former can be true at times, the latter is completely wide of the mark. After spending the year watching him, Jaden Ivy has shown me he can improve in-game, over the course of a season, and is ready for the next challenge. I expect complimentary off-ball skills if he's joining a Cade Cunningham or Shea Gildas Alexander, and as long as he commits to that side of the ball consistently, very good defense. But I also think he's shown the potential for lead ball handler duties, and I truly hope that whichever team drafts him is ready to give him those. Few are going to work harder than him, and few are going to have uglier games than he may have in his rookie year at times, but it's also possible that nobody else in the draft has quite the bright future as he does. 20.8 left. And what has turned out to be a thriller here in West Lafayette. And they're going to try and get the last shot. So you're going to think check out if you're Ohio State and hit the glass if you're Purdue. Hunter, the senior, guarded by the freshman Branham. Puts it in the deck down to four seconds. Hunter in the corner. Ivy for the win. Hey! 